heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 340, covering the week of January 16th through January 20th, 2023. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab and our Facebook pages, and subscribe to our YouTube page. The YouTube page is a great resource. We have not only this podcast, but also our lectures, our Abbeville U videos. Uh, We have a lot of great resources there, so you want to get that. And if you want to help support the show, support the Institute, support the podcast, support everything we do, there is a little heart button under the videos. You can click on that. It's a super thanks button, so you can throw a few pennies our way. Of course, we do exist on your generous contributions alone, so if you like all these things, you can give a donation at abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us that email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's a great, great gift, free of charge to you, simply for giving us an email address. And, of course, you get on our email list, which is how we can communicate with you best. So don't unsubscribe. You get our daily dose of Dixie Money through Friday and any other communication we have, like forthcoming events. We have a couple of those. January 28th, we have a free webinar on antebellum Southern conservatism. It's a Saturday, but it is free of charge. So if you want to hop onto that, you can, free of charge. You just got to sign up and register. We also have our 20th anniversary event coming up in April, April uh, 13th through 16th. Uh, Information about that is available on the website, but it's going to be a fantastic time. So it's at Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia, a real resort. It's going to be a beautiful place, beautiful time, a lot of great fellowship and friends. So coming out to the 20th anniversary event, also sign up for these free webinars. We're also working on one for March. I think we have that hammered down. So there's going to be a lot of great things coming up this year at the Institute. And of course, all of those things are possible because of your donations. Also, download our free mobile app. It now it does now work for Apple. So if you are listening to this on a mobile device, you can get our app. Just go to the App Store, whether it's Google Play or Apple, uh, the Apple uh, Store, and search for Abbeville Institute. It will come up with the app, and it will work. So we've got our mobile app again, free of charge to you, if uh, you know if you want to use that. Um, so that's a, a great resource as well. You can also use Amazon Smile. If you do shop at Amazon, you can make us our, your preferred 501c3 uh, uh, organization for your Amazon Smile donation. So every time you shop there through Amazon Smile, we get a few pennies. It's a great, great way to help the Institute painlessly. Also, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Let people know you like it. Give it a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Leave a text review where you can. Also, uh, if you <clears throat> go to the YouTube page, Leave a comment there. It does help the algorithm. So lots of great ways to support the show. Um, We do appreciate everything you do for us. Uh, We can only exist because you help our programs and help our website and do everything you can financially. So if you got five bucks a month, again, here's my appeal. If you got five bucks a month, we'll take it, right? I mean, we'll we'll take whatever you can give. Um, You know, if you got $50 a year, we'll take it. So you know, we're not asking for thousands, uh, but if everybody that was on our email list or listened to the show and and uh, contributed, we would have a tremendous revenue stream. So it, it's a it's a great way to support our mission to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition and help us continue to do all the things we do. All right, well, let's talk about the material for the week. And of course, this week uh, for for many across the United States, Monday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's a federal holiday. And Boyd Cathy has, has written a couple of pieces about this before, but he published a good one this week because of the fact that the Kirk Center um, has uh, created a program where they've linked Russell Kirk and Martin Luther King. Now, Russell Kirk is one of the foremost conservative voices in American history. Uh, Russell Kirk was someone who admired John C. Calhoun, who admired John Randolph of Roanoke, wrote a, a, a biography of John Randolph. Uh, he's written several pieces on John C. Calhoun, included a chapter on Calhoun in his book, The Conservative Mind. He had a lot of nice things to say about the Southern tradition. Uh, he didn't have a lot of nice things to say about Martin Luther King. In fact, as Boyd points out in this particular piece, he never really liked King that much. He actually... Um, thought that King was dangerous. Um, He did like this kind of Southern populism. He liked George Wallace, for example, for everything Wallace said outside of race. I mean, I'm not not trying to create a situation here where there's a dichotomy between 
king and the southern tradition based on race. That's not it. But he considered King to be a dangerous communist. And of course, to, uh, to Kirk, communism was no part of the American tradition. And the South, as he points out in the conservative mind, was one of the areas, one of the regions that tried to resist this headlong rush into leftism. And Calhoun and Randolph were a nice expression of that. Now, there were many other Southern conservatives as well, but, and we're going to get into that in this webinar we're doing on antebellum Southern conservatives. But uh, I think what Boyd is trying to show here is that what's happened now in America with conservatism in particular is an attempt, an effort, to take discarded leftist heroes and make them conservative. This is essentially the thrust of the 1776 Commission Report when they laud people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Martin Luther King. These are leftists. Kate, Elizabeth Cady Stanton would never have been confused for a conservative. Frankly, neither would Abraham Lincoln in 1864, and of course the 1776 Commission Report tries to do that as well. In fact, the Republicans often called their opponents conservatives. They thought that uh, you know they were not conservatives. Now, they did it in an offhand way at times, essentially implying that these people really weren't conservatives, but um, they were conservatives. And the Democrats at the time did call themselves conservatives. What were they trying to conserve? Well, in their mind, the original Constitution and the real union. They looked at the Republican Party as dangerous to the original founding principles of America. Now, of course, the 1776 Commission people, the West Coast Straussians, the neoconservatives, and even the leftists would say, well, this is not true. Lincoln embodied this idea of America, which was all men are created equal. And, of course, as we're going to do with the 1607 Project, which is another thing we've got coming up this year, we're going to point out that that idea of America was nobody really believed in it, um, that it, actions speak louder than words. And in fact, when Nicole Hannah-Jones says things in the 1619 Project that, well, I mean, we believe in the idea, but Americans never lived up to it. This makes Northerners very uncomfortable because they don't they have this treasury of counterfeit virtue. That's why they're uncomfortable. It's why Jesse Jackson or anyone else makes people in conservative ink and Northern conservatives uncomfortable because they have to have this myth, this Lincoln myth. It has to fit them. They, they have to have this shield of virtue that they never did anything wrong. And because they never did anything wrong, you cannot criticize them. So, um, and they were always on the right side. They're doing the right thing. They're fighting against slavery. They're fighting, you know, they're fighting for uh, black Americans. But this wasn't really the case. And of course, Southerners pointed this out over and over again. You all are just, you're lying. Uh, you don't really believe this stuff. If you did, you would do different things. And uh, one of the things that... Um, is interesting is when the war is over, you have three northern states with the ability to pass legislation that would have allowed black Americans to vote, and they all rejected it. So if they all believed in this proposition nation, that all men are created equal, that you know black Americans should have equal rights and equal citizenship and these kind of things, they didn't really do that on a regular basis, even in the North. They didn't do that. Now, what's amazing is that blacks could vote in North Carolina up until the 1830s, and then it was restricted. But there was a lot more, there's a lot more complexity to this situation in the history of America than what you get out of this very cartoonish portrayal of Martin Luther King, race relations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and this Lincoln myth in America. And of course, we all know the things about King that are, uh, you know, that you, if, if anybody on the right had these kind of skeletons in their closet, uh, would not be uh, championed as they are. For example, the fact that King was a plagiarist. Uh, you know, uh, he serially cheated on his wife uh, in, in some pretty uh, horrible ways. Um, these kind of things would not go unnoticed if you were on the right. I mean, we, we, for example, we have to tear down a statue of Thomas Jefferson, or we have to tear down Thomas Jefferson's image because of a lie about the Sally Hemings affair, or at least, uh, if, if you even want to say it's a lie, but the evidence is very circumstantial at best that he had a direct relationship with Sally Hemings. But yet, and so this is, this is a man that's considered you know, somebody who had uh, you know, committed assault on a woman. Yet Martin Luther King does the exact same thing over and over again, documented with tapes. And we have a big statue to King and nobody talks about tearing him down. So see, the, the hypocrisy and the unaccountability for leftist heroes is just amazing, right? So this is the real issue with it. And of course... One of the things that 
uh, has been done across the South, and they've they've coupled in some states Martin Luther King Day with Robert E. Lee Day, and um, and again, what that does, unfortunately, it does create this this situation where then you would think that Lee was uh, you know the 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 uh, white Americans. Uh, hero and King is the black American hero, and we got to have this dichotomy on race. When in reality, I think all Americans, white and black, should celebrate Robert E. Lee uh, as a great American, a symbol of a great American with American virtues. Now, we know that Lee, just like Lincoln, was a man of his time. He did not hold the same kind of racial views that we hold today. But we also know that Lee was a devout Christian a good man, even when you have this Atlantic article, article uh, you know, the, the myth of the Conley General Lee, which, of course, I've uh, just completely eviscerated at Abbeville Institute in the uh, article, Robert E. Lee versus Twitter Historians. You should go out and check that one out. I wrote it years ago, but it still holds. I mean, look, Lee was not uh, what this stupid Atlantic article says he was. The evidence isn't there. So we have this, uh, you know, this the situation where we've got Martin Luther King uh, as held up as uh, you know sacrosanct, same thing with Abraham Lincoln, and then anybody else, uh, particularly from the South, has got all kinds of moral failings. We need to tear them down. And I mentioned Jefferson. We actually had a piece this week from uh, Mark Andrew Holichak, um, and it starts with uh, a a uh, farce, right? This is uh, this is uh, something that he made up. Um, and it's satire, you know. What and, and, and he does it because this is something that historians on the left might might do, or what they do with primary documents. Um, and he brings up these intellectual, pseudo intellectual historians like Fawn Brody and others. But he essentially says that uh, Jefferson, in this made up scenario, had a relationship with Bob Hemings. And he says, look, if you read the uh, letters, and it sounds kind of like something like this could go on, if you have that kind of bind where Jefferson is this deviant. Well, uh, that is what essentially they've done with Sally Hemings and other things with Jefferson or Robert E. Lee. I'll give you an example. The book, uh, Reading the Man by Pryor, uh, Elizabeth uh, Pryor, essentially says that Robert E. Lee had a foot fetish, for example. He was fixated on, on women's feet. This is the kind of stuff you get when you get these psychobabble histories. And I, and I, the prior book, in some cases, is a psychobabble history. Now, there are some parts of the book that I found to be interesting. She had the ability to review a bunch of documents that nobody had seen before. It was, uh, you know, family had found these things in a chest, and so they allowed her access to this stuff. But the fact is, uh, you know, this is the kind of history that you get from these leftist historians who want to tear people down. They want to tear down people that they think are uh, problems in the narrative. You know, Jefferson's a problem because he was a limited government guy. He was a slave owner, for example. And so he's a problem in the American narrative. Didn't free his slaves uh, at his death. Uh, and unlike Washington, you know, Washington did these things. Jefferson did not. So Jefferson becomes uh, this enemy of the, um, of the American tradition when in fact he embodied it. Now, even Lincoln, I'll say this about Lincoln, all the things we say about Lincoln where he was a Hamiltonian, and there's, you know, when you look at Lincoln's economic program, certainly he was uh, interested in Henry Clay's American system, which was just a uh, repackaged version of Hamilton's system. But Lincoln always considered himself to be a Jeffersonian. And what's interesting about that, and so did Henry Clay, in fact, what's interesting about that is when you look, you go back and look at uh, how people talked about the founding period and in the antebellum era, right? So you get past the founding period. Now we're in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Oftentimes Jefferson was somebody that people re would reference rather than Washington. So this is a very interesting situation historically in America, how important Jefferson was. And again, when we talk about this in the 1607 project, that's what we're hitting. We're, 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 we're discussing the importance of Virginia first. And, of course, Virginians, the Constitution, the Declaration, uh, the founding generation, you know, out, out of the first five presidents in the United States, four were from Virginia. You had this Virginia dynasty. How important that, uh, that tradition was with uh, Jefferson's first inaugural. And there's a, we're going we're gonna to do a review on this book at some point, hopefully soon, on uh, Kevin Gutzman's new book on the Jeffersonians. 
And he basically starts with that Jefferson first inaugural and says this program was then carried through, carried through uh, all throughout the next 24 years. And people still did this even after that. So it, even after Monroe was out of office, we're still essentially referencing a Jeffersonian view of America. And so that's why Thomas Jefferson is important. I think Lincoln distorted that. And of course, Boyd points that out on Monday. But regardless, that Jeffersonian view of federalism, limited central government was the dominant view in American society uh, for most of early American history. That only changes when we get this shift in the 1860s and now this idea of American nationalism becomes ascendant uh, because of the war and uh, that becomes the dominant view of American society. So a lot of good stuff uh, you know, when we think about these issues and of course Boyd pointing this out in his piece on Monday and then the satire from Holochak on Tuesday. But then again we have a, the piece by Paul Yarborough on Wednesday, A Sleepy Night in Georgia, where we have... Um, the uh, Herschel Walker fiasco. And essentially, you know, look, uh, the Republican Party in Georgia made a, a major mistake uh, in thinking that uh, just because, again, they're looking at race here. Well, we, we're going to put this athlete, uh, this professional athlete, uh, and we can't, you can't, you're taking the race issue off the table because Herschel Walker is black. And he's this great, you know, athlete, had a great professional career, he's got a name, but he was a bad candidate. Uh, he, he couldn't really articulate his positions very well. Now, one thing that I will say, Herschel Walker was blasted because he sounded stupid. He sounded like, uh, this is what the mainstream is. He sounds stupid. He sounds like he can't do this. Herschel Walker sounded a lot like just uh, rural Georgians. And, and they're not stupid. And I don't think Walker is stupid. Uh, but he just couldn't put his positions together in a way that you know someone like Raphael Warnock could. Warnock is polished. Warnock is a minister. Now, Warnock has his own issues, but Warnock, at least uh, on the surface, is much more polished and able to articulate his positions than uh, Herschel Walker. So Walker was just a bad candidate, but it also shows you how bad the Republican Party is in Georgia. They should have won that seat walking away. Uh, they crushed, the Republican Party crushed Stacey Abrams, uh, and you know, Brian Kemp did. Um, so that should have been the Senate seat as well. If the Republicans had actually run a decent candidate, it would have been the case. But Walker was just so bad uh, that they, and, and again, this was uh, a part of the problem with the Republican Party. They're trying to, to be too cute instead of just picking someone that would articulate positions well as a conservative and uh, push a very Jeffersonian, limited government kind of message. That's what so, that's what resonates with conservative Southerners. So they, they just didn't do a good job with this. And, and Yarborough has always been very um, you know, spot on when he blasts the Republican Party for being the grand old stupid party. This is something that Sam Francis, of course, the Boyd Cathy piece talks about Sam Francis as well, who uh, with um, Jesse Helms tried to prevent Martin Luther King Day from happening because of King's moral failings, if nothing else, and also his attachment to communism and other things, were essentially celebrating the far left. But um, the fact is, you know, you've got people that have called the Republican Party the stupid party for years. You know, Mel Bradford was very critical of the Republicans. Southerners in the 20th century have been critical of the, of the Republican Party as not really that conservative. It's, it isn't. It has never been that way. And so we have to remember that as we talk about uh, you know, politics in the South, the Republican Party has always been the Republican Party. There wasn't really a flip. The Republican Party has always been what it is. Um, it's just that Southerners, conservative Southerners, didn't believe they had anywhere else to go. The Democrat Party moved left. Uh, this is what George Wallace was talking about in the 1960s and 70s. There's, there's really nowhere for conservative Southerners to go. The Democrat Party goes left. The Republican Party is what it has always been, which really is a national, uh, you know, kind of top-down in some ways, a little less left than the Democrats were. But it is the party of Lincoln. I mean, they were the Reform Party. They were the party that was pushing reformist agenda through most of its history. And uh, Southerners didn't have anywhere else to go, so they latched on to the Republican Party. Uh, Barry Goldwater helped along in that process because, uh, you know, Goldwater uh, said some very Jeffersonian things. But um, Southerners have really not had a political home. Conservative Southerners, I should say. Now, you could say leftist Southerners certainly do in, in the Democrat Party, but conservative Southerners have not really had a place to go 
uh, in a long time. So uh, Yarborough points that out, I think, very well and regularly when we publish his columns. So it's nice to have that. And then, of course, we have the last two pieces of the week. If you know anything about you know the, the middle of the 19th century, you know January 19th is Robert E. Lee's birthday, January 21st, Stonewall Jackson's birthday. So these two great men, this is Lee Jackson week. So we had to wrap up with a piece on both of these great men. And they were great men. I mean, great symbols of American Christianity, great symbols of the Southern tradition. Uh, and these are people that for generations a couple of generations after the war, at least two, three generations, were well-respected, uh, you know, well-revered by Americans. Um, I've mentioned this before. Even if you looked at, you know, northern, uh, you know, activity after the war into the 20th century, they often had calendars, for example, often had Lee's birthday and Jackson's birthday on the calendar because they were seen as the embodiment of uh, the American tradition. You had E.L. Godkin, who, by the way, Russell Kirk writes about in The Conservative Mind as well, and I wrote about with Clyde Wilson in Forgotten Conservatives in American History, but E.L. Godkin, who was a Northern partisan after Jackson died, said Jackson is going to be seen as someone who is not just a Southerner, but an American. He, is, he embodies what it meant to be a good American. Uh, and we forget that because they fought for the Confederacy. At least they're, they're supposedly tainted with this. We know Jackson's statue, which Ezekiel Moses sculpted, by the way, was taken down at VMI. Uh, we know that you know, Robert E. Lee, of course, has come down everywhere. So Stonewall Jackson. You can't have these men. There's a reason that Southerners were picking Jackson and Lee and Jefferson Davis. Now, of course, Jefferson Davis, being the president of the Confederacy, had a high public profile. But the people that were chosen for these statues oftentimes reflected the narrative that was trying to be pursued. These are all great Americans, not just great Southerners. Jefferson Davis was a great American uh, before he became the president of the Confederate States. This is a man that had a very high public profile, was a well-respected senator from, uh, from Mississippi, was Secretary of War, helped, in fact, build the military that defeated the South, had a heavy hand in, uh, in uh, renovating the United States Capitol building. So he was such an important part of American history. was a real war hero in the, in the uh, Mexican War. Um, so Davis was you know, really embodied this, uh, this early American spirit. And the same thing can be said about both Jackson and Lee, both, again, war heroes in the Mexican War. Uh, Jackson wasn't considered to be a, uh, a great teacher. He did teach at VMI, and, and he was uh, considered to be an awful teacher. But in terms of a man who could inspire men and the most ardent Christian warrior, and you could say, America has ever had, uh, when it comes to his devout Christianity, he actually you know, taught uh, slaves to read and write, he ran a school, uh, which by law was illegal, but of course we know happened anyways across the South. Um, he was just an important and dedicated Christian and great soldier. And you look at that martial tradition in Virginia, and what did I just do? Well, I named off two Virginians, Lee and Jackson. And of course, we have this tradition also with people like Winfield Scott, uh, you know, of course, George Washington, uh, Chesty Puller, and uh, many others. The, the, the Virginia military tradition really was at the heart of what we consider to be a great America. And you know, Lee and Jackson both embodied that. And so the piece that we had from John Taylor on Thursday, which of course is Lee's birthday, um, uh, it it's great. It talks about Arlington and uh, the effort to, of course, remove this Arlington Confederate monument, uh, which was again sculpted by Moses Ezekiel, a Jewish American. So where where are the where's the Anti Defamation League? Where are Jewish Americans up in arms over this? Uh, they should be. I mean, this is. He was one of the greatest American sculptures. He was Jewish, one of the greatest American sculptures. And they should be very upset about the fact that uh, the federal government is taking down a symbol of Jewish American accomplishment in the Confederate monument in Arlington. At least they're, they're slated to do it. Um, but we have uh, Arlington House, which now we're going to remove the name from. At least there's an effort to get Lee's name off of that. This was, this was Lee's home. Uh, and all of that land was Lee's. Uh, you know, he married into it. Of course, his, his wife was uh, the uh, person that was directly attached to it and, of course, directly attached to George Washington through marriage. Uh, but regardless, um, 
this this home embodied who Lee was. And of course, we know that when the United States Army moved through and they took it, we know Lee's wife had to leave. Uh, and uh, we know that the Union Army confiscated all kinds of Washington artifacts. Uh, they took uh, anything they could that was linked to George Washington. They plundered the home. And then we know Montgomery Meigs simply said, well, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to get these guys. I'm going to put a cemetery right in Lee's backyard so they can't have the house. They illegally confiscated it. In fact, this was, this was proven in a court of law. They had to give it back to the Lees, but now they had already put a cemetery there, and so they really couldn't use it anymore, so they basically had to you know, leave the home. It's a tragic story in many It really is a tragic story. Um, we know that Washington's home, for example, was preserved. It's in Virginia. There was a major effort on both sides to ensure that that home did not face any kind of destruction during the war. Uh, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association did that. But, uh, you know, Lee's home, well, I mean, now it's just a cemetery. And, of course, you can go tour it as Lee's home, but they want to remove Lee's name from it. Well, who else would it even be famous uh, if it wasn't for that? You could say, well, of course, because it's in Washington's family. But there's lots of other homes that are associated with various founding fathers that aren't famous. It was made famous because Lee lived there. That's the only reason it was made famous, because Lee lived there. So... Lee is the reason why we uh, have a historic home, Arlington home. And of course, Arlington Cemetery is only there because of that. And we know there's 500 Confederate soldiers buried at Arlington National Cemetery. And four of them are buried at the base of the monument. But regardless, uh, John Taylor's piece does a nice job talking about the real Lee and why we should celebrate Robert E. Lee and why this home is so important. Um, and it's just unfortunate that we've got these people running around in America now that simply just want to tear anything down that they don't like uh, and they think is you know the antithesis of America. When Lee really embodied this early America uh, and uh, this, this founding tradition in the United States. And same thing with, with Stonewall Jackson. We had a great piece by Karen Stokes on, on a Friday on Stonewall Jackson. It's from a foreign observer and how important Stonewall Jackson is to uh, the American character and what foreigners actually thought of Stonewall Jackson. Uh, this is, you know, this is why Lord Acton and Robert E. Lee had a correspondence. Foreigners looked at the South, and they looked at Virginia in particular as kind of this last gasp for conservatism in America, that once all that was gone, all of it would be gone. And so, um, you know, you look at how foreigners, foreign observers looked at Jackson and Lee and uh, how they recognize these people as a, a real true American spirit. And it's just, again, unfortunate that we've lost that connection in, in modern American society. So great stuff this week. Uh, again, if you're interested in any of our Zoom webinars, we're trying a little thing here, making them free of charge for you. So you can come on out to that one January 28th. Again, Antebellum Southern Conservatism. It's a big topic. There's a great book about this. Uh, first of all, the, the uh, speaker is Adam Tate, who wrote a really good book on this topic uh, years ago. But there's also another, and it's very hard to get now, but there's also another good book. It's also, unfortunately, hard to get. Norman Rizgeord's The Old Republicans, which gets into the same thing, these antebellum Southern conservatives. But if you think that, for example, uh, you know, these people were kind of an anomaly, when you, when you read Tate and when you read Rizgeord and you go back and you look at these, these uh, early Southern conservatives, you find that the, the tradition that they're articulating that strain runs from you know, the founding period all the way up to the 1860s, even beyond. It wasn't an anomaly in American society or an anomaly in the South. It was the dominant position in the South. So I'm really excited about this webinar coming up on the 28th. I'm also very excited about the, the uh, 20th anniversary conference. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers, Paul Gottfried, Tom DiLorenzo, Tom Fleming, a lot of great people, Clyde Wilson, Don Livingston, you know, the, the usual suspects from the Institute. Also, uh, you know, we just have some really great speakers coming out. So you want to get in on that uh, event. Uh, time is running out. You've got till the middle of March to, uh, to register and get your hotel room. Once we're beyond that, we can't take any more registrations. So uh, March 14th is the cutoff date for that event. We've only got about six weeks left for you to register. So make sure you're registering for that event in April. We want to see you there. It's going to be a grand time, and we want to see you at these Zoom webinars. So, until next time, good day. <music>